Alrighty, welcome everyone to Farmies Fight Club. We have got hopefully a series of show matches and this is going to be the very first ever one. We've got Crackety here spending, spawning on the west side of the map playing in teal as the English and his opponent on the east side of the map playing in yellow. We've got Corvinus 1 playing as the Ayubids. Welcome everyone to Dry Arabia. That's the map for today and the first of a play all three show match between two very prominent players obviously in the Age of Empires 4 scene. You love to see it. Pretty excited for this one, that is for sure. The English versus the Ayubids, of course the English is a, a really nice pick for Crackety here. One of the OG civs, one of the originals. Civilizations that, you know, most of us can identify with. Whichever sort of level of gameplay you play Age of Empires for. The English, one of the, uh, probably one of the more popular civs across most skill levels. The Ayubids, one of the new ones as part of the Sultan's DLC. Kind of excited to see how this one will pan out. Of course, the English can have quite a bit of flexibility, but so can the Ayubids. Could see possibly some early aggression from Gragdy here. The English often do go for a little bit of a nasty long web and rush. That can be a possibility. Opting for an early wheelbarrow, which actually is kind of interesting. We haven't seen this for quite a while. Ayubids do tend to sometimes posture towards getting a uh, fast castle type of timing. That can get the dervishes out nice and quickly and get those relics. But will they opt to do the same against the English? We'll have to see because you know, the English can pack a punch nice and early. Either way. Gonna be excited for this one. Hope you guys are having a great morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world, and having a good day. And if you're not, hopefully maybe a bit of entertaining Age of Empires 4 might make things a little bit better. Now early on, of course, getting Wheelbarrow. It's something we haven't seen for a while. Kind of interested to see what Crackety might be opting for here. But maybe it's a relatively optimized build. They do have a couple of options. Can play a bit of greed. You know, second town center could be an option. I haven't seen the English versus the Ibis all that often, I've got to say, so... I'm pretty excited to see what these two players have in store for us. Now, by the way, both these players, of course, do stream on Twitch live as well at the moment. I think maybe both of them are live at the moment. But either way, they will be you know, pretty much streaming quite regularly these days. So it's worth checking out if you're watching this later on and you're catching up. And uh, I'm pretty excited because hopefully, you know, we've got Kraken here and Corvinus today. But hopefully this will be a good series of show matches that we're going to get players of all skill levels or, well, I guess at this sort of skill level, really. And uh, it should give us quite a few good games. What's going on here? It's going to... Wait, he's going to go for the deer camp? Okay, it makes a lot of sense. And it's kind of interesting he's doing this, especially if he's uh, going up against Council Hall opening, because this could be, you know, pretty aggressive. And if it is aggressive, this is very exposed. We often see the English actually posturing towards deer camp because they do have the villagers that can obviously shoot the short bows, which is pretty helpful to have. Well, the deer camps are pretty far forward for Crackety. I mean, to be fair, the deer camp for the Ayubids isn't exactly all that close either, so it's going to have to keep a close eye on this and be careful about it. Now, he's going to go up with the military wing. The Master Smiths looking to get the Blacksmith upgrades for the age. That's kind of an interesting opening. I haven't seen this all that often as well, so this is kind of cool. We're seeing a lot of differences in terms of how this is being played out, and maybe, it looks like maybe the Ayubids is going to be aggressive. Now, bear in mind, you know, going on to the deer camp, if he's looking to be aggressive himself, that will give him some measure of protection. And I suspect maybe he might be opening up with the stable, but obviously we'll need to see what Corvinus ends up doing. He's now getting that lumber up, as you'd expect. He's actually going towards stone, so it's going to be a second town center, it looks like, for the English. So instead, rather than the English being aggressive, it's going to be the Ayubis, potentially. Which could be an interesting one, like the English obviously with the defensive capabilities that they have, the network of castles, the extra arrow slit in the town centre does make things a little bit difficult, especially if they get the second towns that are close to home. Wrap them around with a bit of farms and you're all good, says the English. Curious pick for Corvinus. Now it has peeled away from gold as you'd expect going pretty much heavy on food and wood and possibly looking to get a down a stable that's what i'm expecting but you never really know yeah, well, it's actually gonna be an archer range opening for the ayubids so looking to maybe mass a lot of those and then push on forward the council will have the longbow so this is gonna be an interesting matchup obviously the english have the extra range with the longbowmen a slightly extra cost with them but the ayubids will have the archers that have a slightly mo faster movement speed but of course slightly lower range so it's going to come down to who who wants to take the fight when and how much the commitments happen it could be quite snowbally because obviously you take one bad fight and things can change very quickly in this particular matchup especially when you consider the english being played grackety will be aware about the deer camp but with the second town center there's not too much you can necessarily do about it too quickly if anything he's being a bit more defensive with his longbowman 
Now he will have seen the arch range, and there is the stable being dropped down as well. So it's going to be a bit of a combination, and it looks like he's going to be pretty aggressive. But look at the food coming in for Corvin. It's just so, so heavy. It's looking good. That's going to be, you know, obviously giving him a lot of potential to get plenty of those horsemen out nice and early. And that is the benefit of going for the deer camp. Nice and early. A second town set of positioning. Will it go in the deer camp? Will he place it a bit more conservatively? Like in the new, most recent patch, players have been placing the town set a little bit more conservatively, especially with the English, because of course, you know, deer camp can be important for any civilization, but the English can kind of rely on farms, although it looks like he's going to be a bit more aggressive with the placement. It looks like he's going to go on the deer. Well, no, the gold, rather. A bit closer to the deer, but mostly on the gold. Yeah, it's going to play it conservatively and maybe get a patch of eight farms there between the two town centers. But definitely a mix-up, right? You don't often see this kind of feudal age player by Corvinus. You love to see it. It's going to be exciting to see. You'd love to see strategies like this. I think this is one of the reasons why we love to have these show matches. Because, you know, they might be testing things, might be trying things out. And to see what they can achieve. And it's going to have it on show for us all to see. Here's the first horseman. It's going to come down to Crackety needing to defend. And it's going to be interesting. I mean, obviously Corvinus with the IU bids can build rams eventually. Just having siege engineering for free. Obviously, we're not there yet, just yet. I suspect villagers will garrison inside and take the horsemen down. I, I do worry about Corvinus's position now. Of course, he does have the Blacksmith upgrades, so he will have Iron Undermesh, but the town centers from the English are incredibly strong. A question in chat in terms of uh, whether the matchup is English favored. I wouldn't necessarily say so. I think, uh, I don't know if we've had that many games for me personally to comment on. I don't think I've seen that much, but. It's, uh, in terms of this particular matchup and the way it's panning out, it does look a bit sticky for Corvinus because he's kind of going to be on the back foot in terms of economy. He's going to have to do some damage. He did get the tech up to get all the blacksmith upgrades, but whether that's going to be enough or not, that's the important question. Not been able to do any sort of significant damage, cause a bit of idle time. But Crackety playing it safe and secure with the second town center. And the question is, what does Corvinus do behind this? Does it go for Castle Age? Looks like it, yeah. So a little bit of aggression into Castle Age. And then pack a punch with the tech up. So and this is going to be a, a good thing for him. Because of course, uh, not so much at his level of gameplay. And crack at his level of gameplay. But there's obviously a temptation to sometimes overcommit. And of course, he's not really getting too much value. So any sort of commitment to feed lay units at this point. It's possibly not going to give him too much value. Too much benefit. So really, he's only left with one option. And that is taking up to the next stage. And the question is, what is he going to go with? He's going to go with growth. Which gave him an extra eight villages. Which actually does buffer him a little bit against the second town center play for the, for the English. Of course, an extra eight villagers will uh, actually possibly give him a villager lead or probably even it out a little bit, at least in the short term. And then he's going to work on from there. Maybe get those relics, which obviously the English won't necessarily be able to contest too easily. Uh, two town centers is quite heavy in terms of food requirements to produce and keep on running. That's something to bear in mind. Welcome, Paris. Do you hope you're doing well, buddy. Anatand, Arakan. Good to see you guys here. Starflark, Master of the Templar. Hope you guys are all doing well. The great thing with the Ayubids as well, he can obviously go towards the deer, uh, the berries rather, once he does run out of the deer camp. And that'll be a nice bit of source of food for him, obviously. The Ayubids get the bonuses that they do for the berries. Extra bit of food when they have the mill around it. And faster gatherings are plenty of villages and gold. So the eco nicely set up and poised for highly armoured units. I suspect we'll see some early camel lancers from the stable. It's probably the most natural choice. And with the wood coming in, maybe he's going to drop a musk pretty, pretty open. Like start, as soon as he gets up, probably he's going to put down the the mosque so yeah not likely to see too much in terms of aggression just yet for Kraken he's going to go for his castle age himself but that injection of eight villages is going to be really helpful for Corvinus I think he kind of needs it at this point because the tech up going to be coming in soon for Crackety as well and one thing it's considering in this particular play style for Crackety is if he does drop a white tower you know, putting an ag aggressive stance on this is going to be even that more difficult Slowly but surely, he's getting that. Just comes in now with a castle age. Has 150, 141 wood or so after placing the mo on the mosque. So we'll be interested to see what he places down next. Will he go for a barracks for some gulam or will he go for another stable? It's going to be another stable here. He's going to favor the map mobility. And wants to get out there quickly. He's now relying on the deer camp crackety. So pretty exposed here. Considering he doesn't have any sort of particularly strong melee units to protect this with. No, no uh, spearmen just yet. Going to be up against stable units coming soon. King's Palace is going to be a third town set effectively because of this. 
And it's going to be well poised to defend and even eco boom even further. So going to be three town centers versus one. So at this point, Corvinus needs to make a decision. Does he go for, you know, a very heavy, heavy Castle Age? Does he try to end the game in Castle Age? Does he think about adding a second town center himself? Doesn't it look like it? No stone being collected. It's going to get the veterancy on his archers as well, it seems. Or, well, the archers that he plans to get. Because, of course, he doesn't actually have any at the moment. Heading across with the camel answer. Going straight for the deer camp. And villagers have been pulled away for Crackety. He recognises the potential problem here. And uh, quite heavy on gold. Uh, yeah, he's going to need that gold, though, to be able to produce some units. And I could actually be able to produce units from the barracks. Obviously, he went for the King's Palace rather than the White Tower. So he's not necessarily going to have a huge amount of protection other than the town centres. And it's going to find it a bit difficult to break on through. Going to try and torch down on the gate. Double arch range, double stable. And going on to the, the berries as well. Now, one thing that's great for the Ayub is the fact that he's being so aggressive. He can get these sources of food. Could even go onto the deer camp without too much challenge, I suspect, at least in the short term. The real question is whether there's an army brewing for the English and plenty of farms coming out. The second patch of eight. We'll see if he invests in a third before producing two more significant units. A couple of crossbows possibly heading out. Staying within the confines of the base, though, of course. Camion, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for the subscription. Appreciate it. Very, very kind of you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, but still trickling out units. Got 13 so far. Here comes a dervish. He's already got one relic in the bank, by the way. So that does somewhat equalize or help equalize the economy difference. But bear in mind, with effectively three town centers, things could get wild and out of control for the economy for the English. And I feel like, you know, it's going to come down to the issue of how much damage can Corvinus do in the next few minutes. Now, bear in mind, he could actually start to build some manjanik on the field. He's saving a bit of wood, of wood and a bit of gold, too. It's not too far off. Getting the eco upgrades just to help the eco numbers a little bit. Second mosque going to be coming up to try and secure all five relics eventually. Another patch of, well, there's more than eight farms there. Has got a mosque of his own, or a, well, a monastery rather, of his own. Crackety. We'll give their notification, going to go for the central sacred site. But most of the relics have been mopped up. There's just one here, really. That's there for the Taken, and I think if Corvinus spots that, he will. He should spot that, really. The, yeah, the Camel Arts will take care of that, most likely. Oh, maybe not. Corvinus, there we go. He spots it. We'll take down the, uh, the Scholar, the Monk, in the end, and another relic saved for the Ayubids. And there is that Manjanik on the field. Now that gold position is actually really, really exposed. That's actually kind of a, a slight concern for the English because the other gold is pretty far out as well. Not too well protected within the confines of the base. So that could be a pressure point. I suspect Corvinus's angle of attack has got to be here, right? This has got to be the way he challenges on through. There's a second Manjanik building up now. Sex right in the south for the Ayyubids. With effectively five relics coming in, it's going to be helpful for that gold income. Might need a little bit more though, because as time goes on, Crackety, if he can hold off for the next sort of 10 minutes or so, his economy should kick in. He's going for the armed clad upgrade. The Manjanik. Currently toggled onto the kinetic option. It's great to see, and he's doing a decent amount of splash damage with it. Alrighty, looks like he's got a couple of more production builders coming up. Siege Workshop, looking to get a Springled or two. That's probably going to help against the Manjanik, of course, but he's got to get them out. Possibly we'll lose his second town centre. Well, there are villagers repairing. And he's going to have to garrison. <laughs> Crackett is actually, he's garrisoning and ungarrisoning as the shots come in. He's trying to get as much value as he possibly can. Oh, maybe not that time, though. The army's starting to, wait a minute, we're getting a siege. A siege, well, Tower of the Sultan for the Ayubis. Now, what's kind of interesting about this unit is that it can actually fire. I love this play by Cor of Corvinus, I've got to say. He's going to get his units in, and I'm sure he could probably break down the Palisades. He's going to do that now. It's going to take one or two hits. Now, the siege damage on this thing is is so good. 
600 ram, 600 siege damage, and uh, plus 200 against walls. So the walls just don't stand a chance, really. And they are palisades as well, so that town center is going to go down. i got to say, Kraken is under pressure. It does have a great economy, but it takes time for that to really kick in. It's got one spring old. I think that's the main danger point here for Corvin, is if you can take out that spring old, and he even actually has a dervish with the relic. He decides to actually keep it far forward, so if any units do come in close, he's going to go for a wallet. This is a smart move. I love that play because... It gives him a bit of time, right? Like, even if the English do start to try and engage, there's a threat of a wallow, so he has to back away. And that'll allow the, uh, the Camel Lancers to dive on in and the Archers to get some good DPS. Here comes the Tower of the Sultan. Can't do too much damage with ranged units, so the Man at Arms are going to be needed. But uh, this is going to be interesting. Nian Racing, Racing Cat, welcome in. He's saying, yeah, he needs a better Divine Cosplay. I thought he was going to go for the Divine sort of strategy, but no, he, he changed it up a little bit. No White Tower. But Corvid is coming in with some really fun plays. Coming with the Tower of the Sultan. Takes out the barracks, I believe that was. And they're going to work on the Capital Town Center. Now, this is a bit more meaty. It does have 7,000 HP on it. Although, now take that down to sort of 5,800 odd. But, yeah, Crackety gripping up the army. He's under a lot of pressure, though. Timing could be actually impeccable here for Corvid. Village is going on the west side of that wall to continue chopping the wood. But he's uh, getting a couple of kills now. 12 villages killed so far. So that third Town Center might not actually self save him here. Crackety. Under so much pressure, possibly lose that capital town. So I think it goes down, right? This is looking really dicey for Crackety. I think, maybe, just maybe, I think Corvinus has done it. Like, it's such a strong push, the timing on this. 16, 17 minutes? Guys, take your notepads out, because this could be something interesting to try out on the ladder, i got to say. But a super fun game and super fun opening to this series. First of three Langmots have gone down. Going to work on the council hall now. and I think what's great is, well, the tower of something doesn't actually fi does actually fire itself. It's got nine range attack. Eight tiles are ranged as well, so not too shabby. Oh, Manjanik, they need to back away. He's paying attention, though. Does have two dervishes now. Manantime's going to try and take out the Tower of Sultan, because this is where the massive siege damage come out, comes out of this. But he's going to try his best, maybe, to hold on. For now, does lose the Tower of the Sultan, so that's kind of gone down, but it does still have a decent number of Manjanik. Crackity here to deal with. Camel Lancer's diving on in. Going to get wrap around the Manantime's if he can. Bit of a choke point, but that's not actually going to favour the English because of the Manjanik. Makes it a little bit more easy for them to fire off. Farms are burning. Things are ablaze for the English. And the IE bids moving on in. Plenty of camel answers. Oh, it's going to be a massive shot there. Actually focused on the farms, to be fair. And going to be getting a wallow for if anyone's going to go for the Manjanik. He's going to maybe lose a man of time. No, he dies anyway. It doesn't matter. But he does have to be a bit careful because there's a lot of archers. Not too much of a melee uh, front line anymore with the camels going down. Does have a couple of crossbows, though, which would be great for the anti arm um, uh, damage output. Better just coming out to torch. Oh, he's going to go for a massive mangonel shot. In fact, it probably could have. It looked better than it was. Still a decent amount of HP on those villagers. And there it is, ladies and gentlemen. Crackety taps out. Corvid is coming with some big brain plays. You love to see a different type of IO bids. And to be fair, why am I surprised? It's Corvinus, right? Great opening to the series. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Let's get into game number two. Guys, that was awesome. Kind of crazy as well, I gotta say. Give us taking the dub on that one. And so we've got Ibids played, we've got English played. Let's update, I'll update that all up. Thanks for hopping in, guys. Have you enjoyed that one? I definitely did. I wasn't expecting that. I mean, to be fair, I wasn't totally sure what I was expecting because we haven't seen that matchup, or I haven't seen that matchup all that much. That was a cool one, I gotta say. Right, next map is going to be Holy Island. It's going to be the Japanese versus the Rus. So. Let's go. Alrighty, welcome everyone to a game number two. Between Corvinus and Crackety. Crackety sporting in the northwest, playing in yellow as the Japanese. And Corvinus in the southeast, playing in pink. Welcome everyone to Holy Island. Two fantastic civilizations on water maps, of course. The Rus versus the Japanese. The Rus with an incredibly efficient fishing economy. The Japanese, of course, with a cheaper fishing boat. So they both got great fishing economy. What's kind of maybe a bit of a difference between them is the potential for Shinobi to pop out for Krakadi. I'm pretty excited about that potential option. Can do a lot to damage the Rus economy and the, the docks that might be going up. Curious to hear what you guys think in chat, actually, this matchup. I don't think I've seen this on Holy Island up to now. Obviously, EGT TV has been uh, been absolutely fantastic recently with the Elite Classic. We've seen a lot of, uh, well, a decent amount of Holy Island games, but not seen these two civilizations in action. 
or at least not in this particular matchup. But of course, game number one, heading in the direction of uh, Corvinus early on. I wonder what Crackety has up his sleeve. Obviously, the, uh, contesting the deer camp, that's something that both players need to look to do with the Rus looking to get the bounty. He does have one deer camp quite close to his base, actually, so that was quite nice for him. Hasn't yet spotted the one on the right. On the west has been spotted by Crackety. A scout now moving back out. That's probably the second. Has he actually already gone for one scout? Quite possibly, actually, because he might want to have kept the food so he can just stay with three villagers on food. Looks like indeed. It's just one scout play. Of course, everyone wants to pump the economy into word for the docks. Uh, the dock is up and running now for the roost, but not being able to afford anything just yet. Needs a little bit more wood. Bear in mind, despite the uh, the roost economy being incredibly strong in terms of gather rate of the fishing ships, they're obviously a bit more expensive, 150 wood. And when you compare that to the Japanese, well, the Japanese have already got two fishing ships out there, and like 45 wood. So you can afford three and a bit fishing ships for each Rus uh, lodger fishing ship. Although there's one there. I don't know actually how early that popped out. Maybe that was working already. But, but one thing, bear in mind, they don't have to drop off, right? So they don't have to come back to the, the dock to drop the food off, which is incredibly nice for that, that Rus economy. And what is really good for the Rus economy is their wood economy. If they can get that uh, wooden fortress out, or if they go for the Kremlin, it would increase the gather rate on uh, a lumber camp. And Japanese going out to gold now, so we won't see too much action in the super early parts of the game. And hybrid maps like this, obviously, the economy is pumping into fishing ships, but boy, oh boy. As the game does develop, the income of food is going to skyrocket, and I'm sure then we'll see some action. Now, I'd like to say, uh, you know, a very big thank you for everyone tuning in if you're enjoying the content. Um, hopefully, there's going to be a recurring series of, you know, various different players going toe to toe. Best of, uh, we'll play all three at this stage. And uh, hopefully we'll get some good games out of this. Just a couple of things to go during midweek, maybe in between EGC TV tournament casts. And of course, he spotted the dock. You'd always expect that to be the case. Now, in terms of food economy, they're pretty similar considering. That just shows you the power of the lodger fishing boats, right? Kremlin going down in a, a nice spot to protect the gold and the deer camp. Again, no real surprises. I was actually going to move it around a little bit. Is it going to go for... The stone and the wood? Yeah, it's going to go for the stone and the wood. Maybe look to get a second town centre as well. Although, I wonder how greedy that is. That does sound a lot of, uh, pretty greedy, especially when you're going to think about you're going to have to fight on water relatively soon. I think a second town centre could be could be something you want to not do. Obviously, the big difference between a hybrid map and a non-hybrid map is the water consideration. The Cocker Township, that's something we'd love to see. Kind of expected this one. The Cura Style House, obviously an incredibly strong landmark, but I think you kind of, you kind of have to play into the Shinobi try and help you in the war efforts to try and take out the enemy's docks. I think it's a it's a relatively standard play. We'll see how it manages with this. Because Cura Storehouse can be good in a pinch. But I think generally, you know, if you're relying on the Cura Storehouse, it's probably because you've lost the waters. And if you've lost the waters, you, you know, you've probably lost the game. There's the Kremlin. We're going to give him an extra 20% more wood. And of course, gives them access to the Kremlin Gremlins, which could actually be drafted in against the Shinobi. So that's come, something to bear in mind. Like a lot of other civilizations might struggle with the Shinobi. And even still, the Rus might. But the Kremlin Gremlins might help a little bit in that. So do you see the second dock being built now for Corvinus? Just the one so far for Crackety, although he probably could afford one relatively soon. But I suspect he won't because he's probably saving that wood. Now that he's getting to the feudal age, he's going to be pumping out. Some miniature ships. So many fishing ships. Holy moly. Nine of them, guys. And yeah, there it is. Going to pop up with a springled ship right off the bat. Going to get a Shinobi too. It's going to be walling in the gold vein. I like that play. I think it's certainly something that he has to protect, right? Because uh, sure, the Shinobi could go for the dogs, but there's no reason to stop them trying to go for the gold villages as well. But uh, it's a heavy wood investment to do that. And obviously that's wood away from getting fishing boats or even attack boats. Now he can just convert what he has. If he so wishes. And here he comes. Comes across with the war junk. I'll have to keep an eye on the shinobi as well. There he goes. First Lodger Galley on the field. It's going to get another one. 
That's kind of a, an unfortunate because well, there's a Springle ship there actually to be fair. So that's kind of what he needs to fight this or maybe even a demo of course. He does have one queued up so going for one of each at this point. He's going to engage for now at least. He needs to back away though of course. Can't take too many hits. He's going to back away to get healed on up. Surprising to see uh, Crackety not dive in there a little bit. Of course he's concerned about the, the demo ship and rightly so. Shinobi going for the gold villagers instead. Now he's going to go for the dock. I suspect he's going to use Sabotage. It's such a strong ability on these docks. He's going to be able to idle them out for a short period of time. There we go. 30 seconds. But uh, also does, you know, 200 sort of burst damage on it. And does set it on flames. The second Shinobi on the field already. But yeah, just forcing the issue. Making sure that it can't break on through. So I love the new patch, by the way. The fact you can wall up like this. It, it forces them... To have to go around, of course, he wouldn't really be able to because of the TC there. TC fire would hurt him quite significantly. And he's grouping up with two Shinobi for now. Surprising to see him not attack. I mean, obviously, he's worried about the, the attack galleys. There's not too much he can do about it. But what could be interesting is if Krakadi starts to push the issue on waters, then obviously Corvinus is going to be forced into it, right? He's going to have to actually try and attack it. And then he will leave this area unguarded. And that would give an opportunity for the, uh, the Shinobi to actually move on in. He's moving on in with a decent number of war junk. Sprinkle ships going in first. Looking to take out the, uh, the fishing ships. Maybe he was trying to take the attack galley. But actually, attack galley did go away and... Demo going to get a good hit on this. I don't think he can deny it. Does get the hit. Does take out one of the, the Springled ships. But with uh, the three Springled ships for Corbinus, he's going to take that fight. Actually, he should be okay with this. He's going to be careful here not to uh, stay there for too long. There's the demo, though, for the Japanese. In fact, there are two of them. The attack ship does come in, try and take them out. Does take out one. About to maybe get a second. Oh, he just didn't quite get the second. But ultimately, that was a, a good pick off there by Corvinus not to get hit by that demo ship. Oh, he might get hit now, though. No, he does back away. Not taking the bait. This is where micro becomes so important, right? One big hit, one big hit there, or one snipe can make the big difference, especially when you think about demo ships. Behind this side, the wood economy is looking strong here for the Rus. I say it's for the Japanese, to be fair. Double broadaxe coming in, though. Going to really amplify things for the Rus. All right, well, it looks like an outpost is trying to be going up. And, you know, I quite like that. I mean, ultimately, it's going to be very hard for the Roos to deny. It doesn't have much in the way of any, well, any land military. And with a couple of Shinobi to defend, villagers will might find it a little bit difficult to rush that down. Although, there's that single villager. <laughs> yeah, someone chatting, commenting on the, the walls is quite funny to see. But yeah, it's keeping him protected, that's for sure. Although, we'll have to see for how long with that outpost going up. He's moving a bit further forward now, the Japanese. He spots it with the scout. And the question is, how does Corbinus react to this? Is he going to send the Kremlin Gremlins? He's got two so far, so that's definitely uh, an option for him, and he's doing that now. Better just to back away. Now, bear in mind that they do have a short lifespan, but he's actually got 1.5 movement speed. Versus the 1.12, the villager probably won't be able to get out there in time, unfortunately, which is a bit unfortunate, but yeah, he's going to have to try and get out of there as best as he can, but Corbin is trying to block him in. They're doing a decent job of it. Crackily trying to block in the Kremlin Gremlins, and I'm not sure this guy is going to survive, although how much time is left? Yeah, I think he dies, unfortunately. 30 seconds. Shinobi becoming involved. But I think in a straight-out fight, this would be kind of interesting to see. I think, well, obviously, there are two Kremlin Gremlins. Shinobi, though, have a really good damage output. 20 melee damage, and he should be able to win that fight, but ultimately, obviously, it's, it's costly HP being lost. Taking the fight on the waters, though. Crackity diving in with the archer ships. Springle ships are tanking that front line, but there's just quite a decent mass there for Corvinus. I think Crackity is going to back away. Probably rightly so. Oh, he's going to lose the ship there. That's unfortunate. You really want to keep those ships alive as long as possible. Now, Corvinus is going to heal on up underneath those docks. And the outpost hasn't gone up. Two Kremlins coming out once again. Those Gremlins. Shinobi going to attack. He deletes the outpost. Rightly so. Doesn't want to lose the wood on that one. Two 
two Shinobi against two Kremlin Gremlins. This will be a bit more of a better fight, losing a lot less HP this time. But yeah, both players playing it very tentatively. Of course, there's uh, a lot at stake here. The second game where they play all three. Now he's not giving up on this Dream Crackety. He wants that outpost, and he might have a better chance of it now with the two Shinobi there. Question is, is either player going to blink and go to the Castle Age? That's kind of a big question to consider. This time, there are four Kremlin Gremlins. The villagers kind of, kind of, going to try and uh, fool those Kremlin Gremlins, but there's no fooling Corviners this time. This time, though. And there's uh, again another villager, but a, lot, a knight there on the field for the roost. Gonna definitely push that back. It's gonna be another dead village, I'm afraid, for for Crackety. Unfortunately, he's not gonna be able to deny that gold. Corvinus doing well to keep it safe and secure. I think we're gonna head into a big water fight soon. I've gotta say, they're really saving them up. It can be difficult to obviously manage both land and water, but it's like a conscious decision for both players just to say, hey, look, I've got a great economy behind all of this. So if you're not going to challenge me on water, I'm okay with that. Going to get a double outpost on the gold vein. Maybe now there's a posture towards uh, Castle Age for Crackety, right? Although maybe just trying to protect himself against the knight, which is such a great unit for, for Corvinus, I've got to say. Going to pick off one villager. Unfortunately, the outpost didn't go up in time. And that's actually a bit of concern. Like now, Crackety is actually forced into land military. He might have to drop a barracks. I mean, if he doesn't, then how does he deal with the, the, the knight that's on the field? Maybe with a couple of shinobi, but... Yeah, he's going to do it. And the charge comes out for Corbinus. Takes a decent chunk of HP off that guy. He does Shun Shin there with the others. Yeah, looks like he's going to try and fight it off with the Shinobi. One does go down, leaving two behind. They do a lot of damage to the Shinobi, I've got to say, even against Knights. So he's going to take the fight. He's going to win it eventually, although maybe not because the uh, Knight does back away. Does he have a Shun Shin, though? He doesn't. Unfortunately, the Shinobi goes down as well. But the outpost does go up, so he's going to be able to try and get the second one as well to protect himself. It does look almost like Krakadi's thinking about a castle age behind this. And plenty of docks as well. Yeah, he's fish booming heavily. It looks like Corbin is looking to do the same though, getting another mining camp, setting plenty of villages. And he's also heading forward with his uh his military on water. This could be a bit dicey. It looks like it's got a lot. I'm not so sure Crackety has enough to match that. But he does have a lot of production coming up. And taking up now could be actually a bit of a death sentence if he's considering it. Doesn't seem like it, actually. Spending a lot of gold. Maybe he's getting some demos. He's getting some sprinkle ships at least, that's for sure. Second outpost goes up. That protect, protect these villagers somewhat. Early night, though. Trying to get some damage, didn't quite manage it. The docks that have recently gone up for Crackety under pressure. I think Crackety is going to be under a lot of fire soon. That's a lot of rush, rush military ships. That's going to be tough to break through. And that's a lot. Holy smokes. Okay, well, the uh, Sprinkle ship's going to need the front charge. A couple of attack galleys behind them. We have to see if there's a couple of demos coming on the west side with those demos here. Crackety does. Got to be careful. Coming on the right through the middle, actually, Crackety, and Corvin is going around the left side. Did actually, I don't think he connected with that one on the west side of that attack. Crackety pushing on in. Doesn't get a landing on that, so both players not really hitting it all there this time. Crackety does get hit on the demos. That was a decent hit, but only two of them this time. I mean, I think, I think Crackety just doesn't have the numbers. Corvin should take the waters here. This is looking a bit dicey. Yeah, that's a lot of military. Now, if he can pull away the weak ones, Corvinus, he might not even have to. Coming around the west side with the demos does get a good hit on them. Took one demo and one attack ship out there. Archer ship. Another demo, though, for Crackety. He's trying to hold on as best he can. He's going to need some huge demo ships, though, if you're going to want to survive this push that's coming in for Corvinus. Just has so much. He has plenty of food, Crackety. Might need a market just to balance that economy. He's looking a bit dicey. He does lose the demo ship. Didn't quite connect there. And Corvinus might just be weeding in the water in one big fight. Does take a hit there, Corvinus, though, a little bit. I think he's caught a lot. He's got plenty. It feels like now, Crackety, he's on the ropes. He's got to find a solution to this. Somehow, maybe focus on land. Try and claw his way back. 
But it's going to lose a lot of fishing economy. I don't think he can stop it happening. Now he's going to have to transition to farms. Now, one thing that he can potentially do, is, as he is doing, is going to get the Damia Manor, which will also increase the, like, the longevity of the town center. But if he does have a farming transition, it will help. But he's got plenty of food for now. But that could run out pretty quickly, especially if he gets the armored units in the castle age. He has started the tech up, but I think Corvinus is going to do the same, taking that fishing ship out. And, well, he's definitely going to lose the waters now. Feels like there's nowhere back for him on water. Now, Corvinus just needs to switch his attention to land. Do some damage on that front. Plenty of barracks being built as well. So on a bigation, maybe? Samurai? Could be an option for him. The only concern with that, of course, is that the Roos do have extra knights, right? So right, knights will count that pretty well. High trade house going in a fantastic location. He's going to get plenty of wood with that. Plenty of gold through it. Now he's going to take out the remaining docks. Both players are up into the castle age. He has chosen to go for the honor bagasha. He's going to try and raid heavily, most likely. That's a lot of barracks. Holy smokes. So the one thing that Corvinus needs to be careful about is the fact that the Japanese, once they start going with military production, they can really get online. The only concern for Krakeny, though, obviously his economy has been absolutely decimated. Getting 50 food per minute. Yeah, it's going to be rough. He's going to need to start focusing on deer camps if he can. He's going on berries at the moment. And uh, he's going to need to try and get this deer camp and berries sorted and organized, I think. But if he can do some damage, maybe there's a way back. Going to try and rush on across the map with the Anabagasia. Corvinus does have to be careful. Does have the tech up. Going to go for archery range, which is definitely a right call against the Anabagasia. Cavalry can chase them down somewhat as well. But the movement speed for the Anabagasia could pose some problems. He's diving in now. Does have a wooden fortress to protect, although there's nothing garrisoning inside. A bit. One concern for Corvinus would be possibly the lack of gold. He's got about 300 in the bank, but I think he just queued up some knights potentially. He's going to lose that outpost, and Crackety does have a window of opportunity to do some damage with the military he has on the field. But if Corvinus survives the next sort of 5-10 minutes, it's probably going to be game over, because he's even trading. He's, he's actually trading. And I guess it makes a lot of sense. He's just converted his attack ships into traders, right? Might as well. And that's going to be a source of gold, so he doesn't need gold from anywhere else. A nice play there. Nice thought, I've got to say. That's looking good. Let's take a look at how much gold coming in. 218 from the high trade house and the trade ships getting 56 gold, 56 wood. That economy, you can see it. The income looking hefty. Can I try to take down the production, which will certainly help limit the war efforts for Corvinus? But if he, yeah, if he doesn't push on further quickly, he's going to be under a lot of pressure to be able to stay in the game. He's now getting the Daimyo Palace upgrade. The issue is that farming transition now is kind of tough, right? I think he just needs to make do with what he's got and take the food he gets off the map. And then maybe if he can get some respite, if he can get a good standing army, maybe there's a way through. I've got to say that Corvinus is under a lot of pressure. That's a lot of units, right? The Japanese pumping out so fast. This, this, is, this game is actually not over, I don't think, for Krakeny, surprisingly enough. Despite having lost waters, he's got an opportunity on land now to do some significant damage. He's really forcing the issue, which is definitely the right play. Going to get a massive swipe on those villagers. Plenty going down, and... I mean, could this be a way back for Crackety? Plenty of cavalry. Going to be diving in that choke point. Now, the great thing about the choke point, it actually really suits Crackety's play here, because the Onobagasia have the extra range of attack, and so the meta units for the Roos won't like that, that's for sure. And he's taken the majority of it down. Actually, wait. I mean, Crackety might have just big-brained this. This is incredible. He's getting so much value out of this. Going to chase down the horse archers as best he can. Try and get through the uh, the choke points if he can. He's taking as many villages as he can. But, uh, of course, the Roos do have the Kremlin as a defense. Could actually activate the Kremlin Gremlins to help out as well if he needs to. Plenty of cavalry on the field. One concern for Crackety is the horse archers, right? The ranged unit is going to be an issue to deal with. Going to try and back away. And he's lost a couple on the retreat. Knights are going to chase that down, and maybe that push was what he needed to win the game, because he's going to go back onto food, onto Withering Fortress, and try and escape the military numbers. Corvinus starting to build up the military numbers once again, got a good front line, a couple of militia in there as well, the horse archers. But here comes a second wave for Kraken. If he gets a good surround here, this could be problematic. He needs to get out of there with the horse archers if he can, Corvinus, or at least keep an eye on them. Make sure that the Onobagation don't catch up to the movement speed-wise. 1.5 versus 1.62, so the slight edge on the horse archers, as you might expect. Crackety going to take any opportunity he can to try and swipe them down. 
plenty of trade set up. I've actually gone to the dock on the, on the south corner of the map just to increase the travel distance. Make it a bit more of a clean trade route. A crackety. He's uh, possibly going to run out of food soon on the deer camp here. So he's going to have to move us somewhere else. It's going on the berries. There is a board to be taken there too. Now if Corvinus can deny these food sources, that's probably one way for him to win the game. Going to charge him with the honor bigation. When it comes to an issue where Corvinus might just look to try and kite this significantly, he's kind of halfway on the map. So he's got some wiggle room. We'll crack it, eat, just try and dive this and try and suffocate Corvinus. Not so sure he has enough for that just yet. Going to take out a couple of knights though in the meantime. Does have a couple of mana tiles for Corvinus, which will certainly help in that fight. A decent meat shield in front of the horse archers. More coming on through. The navigation will clear that up. Just leaving mostly the horse archers remaining for the ruse. Now the big concern is... Oh, wait. Yeah, I mean, Crackety could potentially take... Uh, there's not much he can do about the docks, really. It won't help him take them down, because... The ruse don't have to drop off anything there. He's starting to build up a decent number. There's a bit of wood coming in for the Japanese. I wonder whether he will look to get couple of farms now relic wise he has actually brought some home but not got a uh, monastery just yet a shinto shrine because he needs the wood for other things at the moment well such as backing away on the possibly could try and gap close it's kind of this cat and mouse game right because obviously the ranged attack for the horse archers puts him in a good position as long as he keeps in the middle of the map he's got wiggle room to retreat to right what crackly really wants to do is try and suffocate corvin as he can if he can it's not an easy ask. Can I get a keep just to protect himself? I'm going to dive in once again. Might get on top of the uh, the knights, but that's going to buy time for the horse archers to do some damage. Bear in mind the real counter to the Anubigation are ranged units. So the horse archers are a nice pick here for the ruse. Going to try and take out the Katana Bannerman. Just survives for now. On Bigesh, you're going to get on top of that. Oh, that's not really a fight that Corvinus wants to take. He gap closed there pretty well. Well, he does now have a Mangadal, and that's an issue. He's going to try and dive on that. He's going to peel off a couple of units towards that Mangadal. Does get another shot, though, on the Honor Bigesh. Going on top of the keep. The keep is not built uh, just yet. Looking to try and deny that as best he can. But here come the Kremlin Gremlins. The big difference maker, you feel. And a lot of the Honor Bigesh are super weak. And maybe try and go to the back wood line. There's actually nothing there. He's moved his villages away. And uh, he's not going to get too much more joy out of that. I suspect if he can get some villages onto that keep ones again and build it on up. That's probably way out of this situation for Corvinus. Anabagishas have all been taken down. And Corvinus can breathe again. There's another wave being prepared though. Taking the berries, taking the ball. Now he's got a bit of a window of opportunity, like it's going to be another maybe 10 minutes or so that he can rely on the food on the map. But after that, it becomes a lot more tricky. He might need to get those farms down. And that would halt on the pressure. Three relics though. Five relics in fact, two more being deposited. Kraken, he's by no means out of this. His way to come back in the game, I, I gotta say, like, you know, it's been he's been super resilient. But only relying on the Onabigasha for now. Could potentially get some mounted samurai, but we'll have to see how he opts to play this one. Maybe some regular samurai too. Just would give the Onabigasha giving them some melee units to fight across and over. But they're just having to garrison inside the outpost. But here now, with Corvinus pushing out on the map, he is starting to deny the important key resources of food coming in. I've got to say, 2,000 food coming in there for Crackety. That's intense. Considering the Russo around 1,700. Taking that fight, he had to split up the horse archers. The horse archers aren't there. And this is a great fight for Crackety, I think. He's going to take it in a big way. The outpost still there. And the concern of those archer numbers, whilst they're decent, he might gap close pretty well on the right side. Horse archers pushing away the villagers in a good way. And that's a, that's a problem. The horse archers going to take out the economy. That's a problem for Crackety. He's going to lose a lot, I think. Yeah, that's not great for Crackety, I've got to say. A lot of his food economy taken out in a blink of an eye. Oliver Gesh is going to try and get a wrap around if they can chase on those horse archers, but really Corpus, as you can see, chasing down all those villagers. And I think at this point, 
The problem for, for Crackety is the horse archers, they got a license to go away. Especially because he's got a keep, right? Corviness doesn't have to necessarily worry about it too much. He's got the static defense, so he can move out and be a bit more aggressive with his horse archers. And if he starts to pick off more villagers, that could become a problem. Crackety down to 500 food per minute. That's not going to be sustainable for too long. Manganels do deploy. Corvin is taking the front barriers as well. Horse archers diving on in. Nothing there to be taken on the wood villages. They're being peeled away. Crackety paying attention. Oh, might lose a couple of Manganels though. Samurai and Onobagashi take out one. About to take a second. He takes that fight and wins it in a big way, Crackety. The numbers don't look great, but he's still not out of it. The concern is the idle time being caused. He doesn't have much of a bank of resources. But compared to what Corbinus has got in his bank, he's uh, he's got plenty. And there it is, ladies and gentlemen. Crackety taps out. Corbinus takes game number two with some really interesting plays. Crackety, though, he was super resilient after losing the waters. He tried a couple of things, just wasn't able to make it work. We're going to head into game number three. Alrighty, so it's now two... Corvinus and uh, we've had Japanese played and we've had a Rus been played alrighty looking good yeah I mean it all came down to that big water fight right it just changes everything and then from there it's just about Corvinus seeing out the rest of the game Crackety has to do something a bit funky right GG's. <laughs> yeah, so I think Corvinus dies his hair sometimes. Yeah. All right, we're going to head into game number three. I'm pretty excited about this. An old pick, yeah, it's an old pick. I don't actually have a new one from him. I'm going to have to try and get them updated, but yeah, it's an old one. Yeah, I think he's, uh, it's, it's probably fairly old, to be fair. How's it going, Portuguese? How's it going, Jenna? Right, let's catch up with chat. We're going to head into game number three. How's it going, uh, Ataraxi? Carbonara. Hope you're doing well. Lehak. Samurais, yeah, yep. Yeah. yeah, in terms of price pools, it's pretty modest at the moment. How's it going, Kai, uh, Kai PTM? Actually, self flooding at the moment. Alrighty, let's go into the next one. So it's going to be Cliffside. Uh, this is one of my favorite maps. We've got a Jushi Legacy for Corvinus. Crackety here, busting out the Ottomans. Alrighty. Alright, welcome everyone to game number three in this Play All 3 series as part of Farmy Army's Fight Club. That was the name we settled on, wasn't it? That was indeed. So I'm pretty excited for this one. Crackety, Corvinus. North corner of the map playing in tier. We've got Crackety playing as the Ottomans. In the south, Corvinus playing as the Jushi Legacy. On cliffside. I mean, this is going to be interesting. On Obviously, Jushi Legacy can be... Well, they can play different styles, really, to be fair. They can be a bit booming. Kind of go for the macro approach, eco approach if they want to. Song Dynasty can be pretty nifty. So they've got a great economy behind things, but they can be aggressive as well. Like going for a crazy Chukunu rush in the feud ledge is a thing. If you want to cheese it up a little bit, and it maybe not even a bit of a cheese, like it just might be something he needs to do because it could be under up uh, against a lot of pressure from the Ottomans. Opening up the military school, looking to get a spearman on the field, looking to challenge the forward gold, which the Jushi Legacy have right now, which is not ideal. But of course, the Jushi Legacy can rely a little bit on tax collection from the Imperial Fisher and also the Meditation Gardens if he does get it close to the gold. That could bring in a couple of gold resources in as well. 
Now, the Ottomans have a couple of tricks up their sleeve. They used to be kind of just a one-trick pony with, uh, you know, pumping feudal age units, going heavy feudal age, and maybe early castle age pumping out as well, just focusing on free units. But they can go for a little bit of a cheeky, fast Imperial these days. You know, coined by a well-known YouTuber, of course, Ozzy Drungo, coming in with that crazy strategy. And uh, it's been working well for, for some people, for sure. The Ottomans, you know, the military schools does allow them a little bit of flexibility in terms of being a bit more greedy about tech-ups. They obviously get free units to try and buy their way there, or at least buy some space and room to get there. Of course, against the Jushi legacy, it's not a civilization you want to let them be too untouched with their economy. The Ottomans generally, probably in this situation, would want to do some damage. Either way, I hope you guys are doing well, enjoying the best of, or well, Play All 3 series. I'm going to have to get used to saying that. It's not often you get Play All 3 series. But I uh, figure that's probably one of the best ways to make sure we get some good entertaining games. Back gold there for the Ottomans, nicely positioned. Of course, not necessarily expecting huge amounts of aggression early on for the Jushi Legacy, but we'll see what Corvinus has up his sleeve. Of course, we could never really, uh, we can never really predict what these guys are going to be up to, considering the uh, the first two games are up to now already. Siji Tang, thank you, thank you. You're very welcome. I hope you're enjoying the games. It's going to be the Shangnang Tower opening up with Corvinus first. Okay, interesting. This is super interesting, guys, because like. I, when, the, when this Civ first came out, there was always a strategy that I quite liked, but never really saw being played. And that was a fast castle, because the Zhangnan Tower and staying in the Tang Dynasty, you know, bear in mind the Jushi Lexi do get the tech ups cheaper with the Tang Dynasty. Obviously, they've got plenty of other bonuses that they can leverage with other strategies. I mean, I don't know if it is a totally obsolete play. Maybe Corvinus might be up to something here with, uh, with a Castle Edge play, because I'm not so sure you often see the Zhangnan Tower opening up with that you often see the meditation gardens right so it suggests maybe he's not going to go for a song dynasty because if you do go for a song dynasty you'd question why would you go for the jungle tower first you'd probably want the meditation gardens first so it could be something a little bit cheeky and aggressive here for corvinus could be interesting the twin madrasa being built how's it going jana yeah i i totally agree with that like i think um I've definitely gained a lot more experience casting. I'm definitely nowhere, nowhere where I want to be. I want to be a lot better. But uh, yeah, definitely over time, I feel like things have improved, which I'm very happy about. But I appreciate that you've noticed that too, so thank you for mentioning too. Hopefully things are heading in the right direction. Twin Men at Madresse for the Ottomans. Again, no real surprises. It's the only landmark you really want to go for the Ottomans in this situation. Going to get plenty of berry bushes and some good food economy that way. Now, sheep-wise, that's a big haul there for Corvinus. Holy moly, 12 of them. Seven of them for Crackety. Now, both of them, of course, now reaching that next age. We'll have to quick take a quick look at what um, you know, Corvinus is up to. He's going to open up with the stable. So we'll look to get a free horseman because of it. So there's definitely a few ledge aggression, right? This is definitely unorthodox. This is definitely something we don't see very often. He's going to keep up some scouts. He's going for professional scouts. Wait, three scouts? Do uh, you know what? Yeah, jeez. There's, there's, sometimes I feel like sometimes you can just go by the playbook and then you've got Corvinus and you think, let's just... We just have to watch what he does, because how, do, how would you predict that this is going to happen? Is he going to go for a stable and multiple scouts? Yeah, he's going to get a couple of spearmen crackety, though, going around the back. Didn't actually challenge the gold. I mean, I guess he's pulled the villagers away from gold, right? So a couple of scouts just to keep an eye on things for Corvinus. I'm curious to see. It's got to be professional scouts, right? That's got to be what he's up to. Up to, yeah. Yeah, I think he's got it already, actually, yeah. Having the usual four on berries and getting that double brawn axe, Crackety. Gonna be building up that economy as you don't normally expect. Thought about going for the tax, but went for the deposit first. And there it is, yeah. I was gonna get the, the deer camp in, so gonna plenty of food. I think it will be a fast castle play, by the way, because you, you kinda want that fast food in. And he's not producing anything more, so curious. Now, apologies for the colours, by the way. I know I, I prefer changing it over to the um, you know, the team colours, you know, blue and red. But unfortunately, 
Uh, there's a bit of a spectator bug at the moment where if you're spectating a game live, you can't actually take it off the, uh, the natural colors that they pick. And it's just, yeah, it's annoying, but I'm afraid. So apologies for the, if anyone's colorblind and struggling. I've tried my best with it, but there's not too much I can do about changing that. If you're playing it from Rex and re replays, it's fine. But if you're watching live, I'm, I'm afraid this uh, this is the best we can do. Double barracks added into the mix. So maybe... I mean, you, yeah, okay, he's not on gold, so he's not a fast castle at all, really. Well, he's in gold. Okay, I take it back. Every time, he's definitely got plenty of abilities now on gold. He's got a couple of spearmen, so maybe that barracks play opening after the stable could be posturing towards palace guards in the castle age. And this is looking to continue with the spearmen concerned about Sepahi, which is always an option. Because Sepahi is something that the Ottomans do love to do, go for. Especially now that he's adding another stable, and the two miniature schools are on the Sepahi themselves. So, can look to protect the stone and gold. Can I just say, a great mining camp for both the stone and the gold. Getting the stone for the Aristlets, of course, and going to be then getting the fortification, I suspect. But yeah, edging there with the food, right, and the gold, you can see there's definitely a, a slight leaning towards that castle age for Corvinus, and it's going to be relatively cheap. In fact, let's just take a look at how cheap it will be. It will actually only be... Oh, I've got to change positions, right? There we go. 1,020 food, 510 gold. Not too shabby a discount. There's a third barracks. So yeah, it's definitely eyeing a, a palace guard rush. He's got plenty of food there. He's got the protection on the gold. Getting the blacksmith possibly for some upgrades as well. Yeah, Tank Dynasty is staying in the Tank Dynasty for sure, at least for now. Uh, blacksmith will help him produce a little bit faster from the military school and the stable on the archery range. Because he's going to have to produce very fast. I think the big key position will be this gold, right? Denying the gold could be a problem if uh, Corvinus doesn't keep it safe. He's given away the fact that he's going to be taking up. He's going to go up with the Mount Lu Academy. Makes no secret about it. And now it's going to be difficult for Gracchity to stop this. Right? The Palace Guards, an armoured unit. Kind of difficult to counter if uh, units for few Lage units. And that's where, obviously, Gracchity isn't at the moment. Although he's edging towards that Castle Age himself. He's not too far behind. But I wonder how much damage Corvinus will be able to do before Gracchity can keep up. Horseman will lose his life to the Sapahi. Moving out on the deer camp. Trying to maybe steal this one, actually. Yeah, a couple of spearmen being kept there by Crackety. Noticing that, of course, Corvinus did go for the uh, professional scouts and making sure that maybe if he does venture out to this deer camp, he's going to lose a couple of the scouts. He's going to go for the Mehmed Imperial Armory. Again, no real surprises. That might help somewhat to deal with the uh, the palace guards as long as you can keep them safe and protected and get a good few hits. Scouts ready for the taking of those deer camp, but those two spearmen waiting as well. A couple of archers going around the back on the wood line, pushing the villagers away. Two spy and the scout. Well, the scout will be lost. The spy will always outrun them. And here come the palace guards. Looking to get Iron Under Mesh as well. That will help him tank and go underneath the uh, Town Sanders if he needs to. Palace Guard is going to look to take the Spearman out. That's going to be a bit of a smash and grab on those deer. Mehmet Imperial Armory just now built. As we head into almost the 11th minute mark of the game. And barracks being added. I wonder if we'll see some crossbows. Yeah, that makes sense to toggle onto crossbows behind all this. On the archery range at least. Try and protect himself against the Palace Guards. What's concerning that the Palace Guards do have good mobility, good movement speed. They're going to be flooding across the map soon enough. Great amount of food income. Courtesy of the Deer Camp and also the supervision of the Imperial Official. That's not going to stop anytime soon with these Deer Camps being brought in. Going to get another military school, but Kraken has got to be careful, right? He's going to be under pressure very quickly. Now, where are the pressure points? Really here, this one this one screen, wood and gold. Something that maybe Corvus would look to target. 
A question about what rank I am? Uh, just only... I, I technically, technically conquer one, but I'd say diamond. Like, reliably diamond, yeah. Right, village being built for the extra population space. Palace guards moving around the back. So yeah, technically my profile at the moment is a, a conqueror, but I haven't played for quite a while. So I, yeah, probably most likely diamond, to be honest. Palace guards moving through on the west side. And he's going to get a good surround, like, on the east and the west. If he can try and pull away the cavalry, split up the army, maybe that's a way of doing this. Meta getting involved, going to be increasing that attack speed for the Ottomans. It's interesting to see that actually he's actually got quite a lot of resources, Corvinus. 500 food and 600 gold. I mean, and he's not produced. Is he producing all the barracks he's got? I think it is, actually. Is there a way in which he goes to the Imperial Age behind this? That would be kind of crazy. Palace Guards engaging with the Sabahi. Trying to take down the, uh, the Mehta as well. Possibly targeting the crossbows first. He's going to lose those ones on the west side. On the east side. Yeah, the Lancers are taking care of this for Crackety. So Crackety looks in a decent spot now. I think yeah, Corvinus will be looking to pump out more units now. And we need to make a transition into the cavalry units. Because if those Lancers start to group up in large number for Crackety. He'll be fine taking care of the Palace Guards. He's starting to move out. He feels a bit more confident about things. The scout's going to be mopping up their remaining deer. Yeah, Corbin is taking kind of bad trades at this point. Losing a couple of palace guards and yeah, those guys are goners too. And all of a sudden, look at the miniature numbers. Whilst it doesn't suggest that Crackety has a advantage in any ways in terms of raw numbers, it does definitely look like he's got the momentum, he's pushing out, and he's got the mobility, right? So it doesn't necessarily have to take a fight if he doesn't want to. On the other hand, Corvinus staying back home now, feeling the pressure a bit. Maybe can't really move out until he gets a bit more of a mass of units. And relics-wise, both players have been pretty busy fighting, so haven't been opting to go for the relics just yet. That might change soon. I think Crackety starting to, to pick up pace, and he's been... Able to stabilize after initial pushing there for the palace guards. And he's going to just expand his population capacity and then move on out. Now, bear in mind, as time goes on, the free units really going to help the Ottomans. Especially starts to get some of those mangonels for free. It does force opponents to often get a siege workshop, and that's exactly what Corvinus has done. Like, we often see this against the Ottomans. The opponent inevitably has to be getting a siege workshop for Spring Orders. It, it's, it's an interesting one because it forces them into spending units, right? So there's one thing about the Ottomans actually getting the unit, the Mangonel itself, but actually forcing the enemy to spend resources to counter it is another element to that free unit being gathered. Does lose a scout, but does deposit the uh, the, deer camp, the deer in a nice spot. Plenty of spearmen, plenty of palace guards chasing that away. Caused a bit of idle time. Going around the back with the scout. Gets an outpost there, Crackety, just to make sure he's safe and secure. Doesn't want to, of course, lose any access to gold. That would be the last thing he wants. Next DLC should have Aztecs. I mean, I'd love to see that. I mean, I, yeah, I'd love to see another DLC. We've had a great one so far with the Sultan's Ascend. I don't know if it feels too greedy to be asking for another one. It almost feels like it, but I kind of want one. I want one soon. It'd be amazing if we can get another one. Because I think as well, because of the fact that Age of Empires 4 civilizations are so varied and diverse, they're so asymmetrical, they're very different from each other, it means that any new civilization is is so cool because there's so much new to, to unpack, right? It's not like each civ has slight changes. No, actually, they're very different. Now, of course, we're talking about non-variant civilizations, but even then, variant civilizations have some cool mechanics. That's for sure. That's for sure. For sure? No, for sure. I hope you're right there. I hope you're right. Hopefully, if it is the greatest selling, there's probably going to be another. I really hope so. One man getting on the field. Will we see another? There it is. Wait, wait. Hey, is he stuck? What's he going on? Oh, there he is. Moving. Out he goes. Now we come to the sort of 15 to 16 minute mark. This is where the Ottomans become really scary, by the way. This is where the economy kicks in. This is where the free units start to really group up. 16 minute mark for the Ottomans is incredibly scary to deal with, but it does have two springles. It needs to push away the uh, the mangonels if it can. It has a nest of bees as well, which is really nice to have against mass infantry like this. It's got plenty of infantry, Crackety, so 
could be exposed, needs to be careful about it, but Mangonel's... Yeah, it's going to come down to a bit of a siege fight. That's kind of what the Ottomans drive. It's kind of their fault, really. Lester Bees fires off on the crossbows. Takes a bit of damage there. Kraken, he's got to be careful. Palascar's rushing on in. Does have two Mangonels trying to lead them in. And bear in mind, does have a couple of Janissaries that could potentially rip through those lances. The Nesta Bees, though, go right on top of the Janissaries. Taking the fight. Spearman tanking that line with the Palascars for the Jushi Legacy. Nesta Bees gets another massive shot. Kraken, he has to be careful. His Mangonels aren't really in the fight just yet. Afraid of those two Springles. Two Springles does try and get the hit on it. Doesn't quite manage it. Now, with this fight, it looks like the Nesta Bees could be vulnerable. Man of Arms diving in on top of that. Needs to be careful not to lose that if he can. Crossbow's working on that. Two Springholds still in the mix, pushing away the Mangonels. But it looks like Crackety might have won that fight in a big way. Nesta Bees does get another shot off. Village is coming out to repair. He's going to have to try and keep that Nesta Bees alive for as long as possible. Does get another shot, but it's only on one crossbow. And I think this time, whilst he might keep the Nesta Bees for a bit longer, I think it might be targeted. No, it looks like actually... The units got distracted a little bit. And time's going on top of it now. We'll lose the Springer. He's going to focus on the Springer. If he can take that down, it'll be useful for sure. That will allow the Mangonels to get some good value. Moving further forward. And, you know, the hill is really hurting those Springles in the end. He's keeping those Bees up alive, though, for as long as possible. There's a second. This could be problematic for Crackety if that second Bees gets a good hit on this. But there's not too much else there protecting the economy. Corvin is under so much pressure. Down to three military. This is where the Ottomans could really start to spiral out of control. They've got three units coming in. The wood line completely going to be decimated unless the villagers do back off. They do back off for now. Nesta Bees still alive. Getting good damage. That was a good shot there for the Nesta Bees, that's for sure. Palace Guards popping out. Does have the defender's advantage. Wait, Crackety losing that momentum. Ultimately didn't have enough to fully push on in. Does have the outpost in the central location. Picked up three relics behind this. Crackety doing great work to pick them up whilst all that fighting was happening. He's going to get the fourth as well. That's going to be putting him in a really good spot. Plenty of farms being transitioned into. Yeah, so we might see a bit of a lull in the game because, of course, both players probably think about farms at this point. Trying to target down on Manganel if he can. Almost about to get one. He should get one there, Corvinus. Good pick off there for sure. Possibly going to get a second. No, he's going to keep that alive for now, of course. Outpost on fire, so we'll lose that there, Crackety. A great game so far. As the game goes on, though, I wonder, I feel like Crackety has a good position because, of course, it's relatively similar common economies. Of course, he does have the Imperial Official, but bear in mind, the Ottomans are getting three units out of this. Four military scores. Farming transition, well underway. Getting a second archery engine. In terms of army composition, what do the Jushi Legs to go against this? Well, you've seen the fact that there have been some man at arms. So it's going to add in that extra archery range for the crossbows, which will also incidentally help against the Janissaries. So I think a mass crossbow play into uh, with Nesta Bees, with some sprinkles sprinkled in, could be okay, but he's got to make sure he wins the siege fight, right? Because if you go mass crossbows, it can be tricky against the, the Mangonels for sure. Plenty of siege, though, being built. Going for the gold now. Now, the Imperial Age coming in for the Ottomans. This is where things become really scary. Great Bombards would be coming out for free. Getting a ram too. That food income, the farming transition has done has been done pretty smoothly. The real concern for Corvinus is because he had a lot of deer camp to rely on and berries too. He's slowly starting to run out of all of this. And a farming transition now could be deadly. He's got a decent standing army in terms of at least siege. Or one lance on the west side, pushing all those villages away. Crossbows will take care of that. Crackety will lose that in the end. But a bit of denial. Four relics in play already. One more coming in. Alrighty, Sacred Sight's going to be decapped in the middle at least. and Might start to see one more push out for a big fight. Corvinus does have a decent amount of military. Spotted that Crackety, of course, is in the Imperial Age. And as you'd expect, like when your enemy is in the Imperial Age and you're not, and you'd have no real signs of getting there, 
That's possibly a time that you could look to put some pressure on, considering Krakadi just has invested a heck of a lot of resources to get to the Imperial Age, which suggests he has a lot of military count, which he does. Villages on that stone get absolutely decimated by the Nesta Bees in a big way. I love the addition of the Ram, going to then take out the production buildings. Nesta Bees will take care of the rest, and the torch damage from the Palace Guards will help as well, for sure. And he's pushing on in. Krakadi has a hard hold, actually. But if he does get the tech ups, he's getting the elite Panas, uh, elite man at arms rather. He's going to need plenty of them, but with good upgraded Imperial Age units that could be could put him in a good spot. And as is always the case with the Ottomans, they have a really condensed economy, condensed base, a lot of choke points. It really favours them as a defending position. Four Manganels, by the way, does have a decent number of Spring Orders, Corvinus, but only four actually. So it'd be tricky, I think. To be fair, with the Manganels, the Ottomans. They can just focus fire on the Springles and take them down. And this could be uh, a dicey hold. He's losing a lot of production, Crackity. He's going to have to move out at some point soon. Crackity coming in with a relic. Of course, she doesn't quite bring that back home. A second ram being added in. And this is actually where a lot of players do fall. So not players at this level, this skill level, of course. It's having the lack of uh, siege to take out infrastructure, right? These two rams getting good work. Well, at least they were on the archery range. Now they're focusing on the uh, real meaty stuff, the miniature score. Heading on in. Looks like the Springle's trying to pick off the Mangan. If he can, picks off the Springle, which is a good start. It's going to come down to a big siege fight, you feel. But elite man at arms, that's going to be tough to deal with because it's mostly palace guards and spearmen here for Corbinus. At least on that front line here come the crossbows. You need to get into the action, though. Take out the man at arms if you can. Nesta Bees getting huge damage out, but the Nesta Bees is going to be critical. Now working on the Twin Minaret Madrasa. This could be problematic. Bear in mind. All three landmarks are on one screen. It does have the Imperial Observatory a little bit further away. We'll have to see a bit further north. There it is. And it's going to be pushing on in. Helping hands! Thank you, thank you, thank you for the raid. Hope you're having a, had a good stream. I've, I've uh, seen you a lot on uh, Company of Heroes, so... We are absolutely stoked, by the way, Helping Hands, that you're playing Age of Empires. And hopefully you're enjoying the game, that's for sure. But super excited to see your take on the game and uh, how you're finding it and... I really appreciate that raid, obviously, because we know you from, uh, well, at least I know you from uh, Company of Heroes. Although, I don't actually play the game Company of Heroes, I just watch it, really, mostly. But super stoked that you're here in the uh, in the community. Hopefully, you're sticking around and enjoying the games. I really appreciate that raid, dude. What's interesting, oh, that's a lot of manga that for crack at you. That's going to be tough to break through, right? Just been doing some campaign to get the feel back. Yeah, for sure, for sure. It's a... Uh, it's a very different RTS to Company Heroes, I guess, in a big way, considering the resources and the way it works, the mechanics. But I'm sure if you stick around long enough, hopefully you'll really enjoy it. Going to try the Japanese in multiplayer soon. Nice civilization to pick up for sure. It's one of my favorites, actually, Japanese. It's been a fan favorite as well since the new DLC. It's one of the most, uh, one of the newer civilizations, we should say. But they're a really nice civilization, actually. So that's a good pick on that one, I'd say. But hopefully. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy because, you know, we love to see when when new uh, new players come in, when new content creators come in to the Age of Empires 4 scene. It's always a nice thing to see, you know. So we're stoked to have you here. It's going to be a bit of a siege siege fest, actually. I think that's the way it turns out with the Ottomans, right? They they, they forced the issue with this way. It kind of not much else can, can happen. It's a bit of a stalemate, I've got to say, with uh, Corvinus now thinking, maybe he might be thinking about going to the Imperial Age. Now, bear in mind, he's in the Tang Dynasty, right? So it will be a little bit cheaper for him. I say a little bit, it's a lot cheaper. 2,000 food and 1,000 gold instead of 2,400 and 1,200. So about net saving of 600, maybe? 600 resources? It's not too shabby. Not too shabby. Off to grab some food. Bon appetit. Have you have a good dinner, maybe? I'm not so sure where you are in the world, actually, to be fair, but... Oh, whatever meal it is, hopefully you have a good one. And thanks for the raid again, I appreciate it, my dude. Now, with four relics, by the way, Crackity, we'll be having a decent amount of gold coming in. Nesta Bees, oh, Crackity, get out of there! Oh, God. Okay, it wasn't as bad as it could have been, because uh, they were mana Arms, so they don't necessarily take huge amounts of damage from Nesta Bees, but it's still good value. Mana Arms are oh, tanking that front line. For the Ottomans, plenty of Manganels for Crackity. Going to absolutely demolish those Spearmen. Sabahi diving on. The, these are elite bits Sabahi, by the way. If they get on top of those crossbows, it will be devastating. Nesta Bees still firing off. Janissaries in the back line. Makes any cavalry play for the Jushi Legacy pretty redundant. 
Sabahi numbers though start to dwindle. Janissary is focusing on the crossbows as much as possible. Two to be still firing off. Getting decent damage on the Man at Arms. That front line looking a bit sketchy now for Crackety. He does have a great bombard behind all of this, and four Mangadels does lose one of them. Does lose another. And the Springlord getting good work. Sabahi sniped it in just in time. Another Sabahi raid there on the Nesta Bees. This is a problematic situation. Doesn't have a front line. Corvin is losing a lot of siege. Those Sabahi getting huge value. Only four of them. That's all he needs. The Springle is now about to be taken down. He's heading further forward with the Great Bombard. Springles all go down. Great Bombard still alive. He's got the Mehta banging on the drums. Two of them, in fact. Three of them. Janissaries and Spahi remain. Not a huge amount of army, but it might just be enough. Only four military for Corvinus. A big push in there in the end. And whilst the Nesta Bees did amount, a decent amount of job for the Juicy Legacy, it wasn't enough. And Crackety is pushing in once more. He's been in the situation before in this game, though. And he did lose that military mass that he had, but this time feels a bit different. Definitely could push out on in and gonna take out static defense in the village. Corbin has definitely got his back on the rights. Bear in mind, he's still in the car stage, right? So as time goes on, Crackety with the momentum, with the tech advantage. This is not looking good for Corvinus now. He's gonna be struggling on food, I think, at this point. He's got a bit of boar coming in on the right side. But after that expires, he's under pressure. 600 food per minute. And the farming transition is very much in the play for the, the Ottomans. He's held on to that initial push that came in from Corvinus. And the second one. And it doesn't look like there's going to be a third for Corvinus, I'm afraid, this time. Plenty of damage and torches coming out. Infrastructure being taken down. With the Mangonels and the Great Bombard. Taking down the Mount New Academy now. Got a couple of units trickling on forward, but it looks a little bit too little too late. We'll see where he's massing up. He's still massing up on the back line. Mostly spearmen. Adding another siege workshop. Getting our nest of bees out quick time. Supervising it. That's a lot of units for Crackety. And it's starting to spiral out of control. And bear in mind, whatever Corvinus produces is just going to be just worse, right? Apart from maybe siege. Just by virtue about being the age behind. Three Mangadels and Great Bombard. A bit of a counter raid with the Spearman. Janus will take care of that. Still getting some value on the west side. Gold being mined. But he's being pegged back quite heavily here, Corvinus. Backed into a corner. Oh, a second Great Bombard now. Things have uh, doubled in problems. And there it is, ladies and gentlemen. Corvinus taps out him and he recognises down and out, right? An age behind, an economy behind, a military behind. Crackety takes game number three. Hope you guys enjoyed this casted set. I definitely did. Hope you guys uh, enjoy the uh, the games that we saw today. Make sure you visit both of these players, by the way. Um, they do stream live on Twitch.